So thanks Delia for inviting me along um, today and I uh, really enjoyed the talk so far and uh, lots of overlapping ideas so um, it's re been really good so far. So um, I won't go through this, this is my background and here's my um, beginning of my career um, working for Warner's a lingerie manufacturer in the days before computers, before the internet. Uh, one of my early jobs was um, writing um, telexes. Um, which most of you won't even have heard of, never mind know what one is, to um, overseas suppliers. Uh, and an early, early role was in the design costing department. Um, and one of my current roles is um, working as a volunteer for the Circular Economy Club, which is an international not-for-profit organisation. It's free to join, um, aiming to network um, across the world all the people who are involved in or interested in the circular economy and trying to get those physically together to share ideas uh, and uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and that's the book that I just mentioned which has got a fashion uh, chapter within it uh, and when I came to do the, the uh, chapter on fashion I realised I could have written a whole book uh, on all the different innovations I was seeing um, and we'll see a few of those later. So in terms of a structure for today, we're going to look first of all at some global mega trends helping shape the way that consumers and the industry are seeing sustainability and the other challenges. We're going to talk about what it means to be future fit um, as, a, as a fashion brand. Then I'll move on to the circular economy and give you lots of examples along the supply chain. And um, we'll finish with some conclusions. So let's start with those global mega trends. Let's see if I can just show you this uh, short video. See if that. So, just to say, we've got it, we've got it open in the in the background. So, <coughs> this is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing, we have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So, 
who's heard of the Anthropocene? Put your hand up if you'd heard of the Anthropocene. I should have stopped the video first. Didn't I? So um, please put your hand up if you've heard of it. So a few people. So I think the optimistic note at the end, um, that we're the first generation to really start to understand the effect that we're having, but also be able to use our um, learning, our creativity and our energy to do something about it. That's the inspiring bit. Um, and uh, I think if we look around at some of the technological innovations that are happening now, um, some things w which you know are almost reality now that we could not have conceived of even 10 years ago, things like autonomous cars, um, then we can see the potential um, for you know, our ingenuity to solve the problems if we get on and, uh, and focus on them. So they mentioned in the video uh, the Great Acceleration, which started around 1950. These charts are from a blog on the World Economic Forum. On the left-hand side, we have indicators of human progress, and on the right-hand side, indicators of human impact on the Earth. They all have the same timeline, so they start in 1750, the beginning of the first Industrial Revolution, and continue through to the present day. And you can just about see on each of them a faint red line marking out 1950, the beginning of the Great Acceleration, when we uh, industrialised agriculture and got better at, fa at farming, healthcare and sanitation. And you can see the exponential upward trend that starts with nearly all of them round about that time. So whether it's world population, gross domestic product, um, transportation, even tourism, they're all following the same exponential upward trend. So unsurprisingly, on the right-hand side, those indicators of our impact on the Earth all follow similar trends. So we've got the different greenhouse gases at the top, um, the ozone layer, uh, nitrogen running off into, into the water, in oceans, deforestation, and so on. And so, as we all know, um, we live on a world with finite resources, not just the metals and minerals, but the land and the water and all those living systems that provide us with clean air, fresh water uh, and healthy soils. And so we need, to, we need to start thinking about things in a different way. Another um, effect at the moment is uh, not just the increase in population, but the rise in consumers. And consumers are defined as those people starting to earn over $10,000 a year, meaning you can move from a subsistence lifestyle where you can only afford food, clothing um, and shelter to having money to spend um, as you wish to do. And of course, those people moving into that consumer lifestyle want to um, live like we do in the, in the Western world. So more meat, more processed food, more technology, more clothes, more stuff. So we need, to, we need to be thinking about how we're going to have enough for all of us forever. And that, that number of consumers, as you can see, is going to rise from just under 2 billion in 2010 to nearly 5 billion in 2030. So 3 billion people suddenly have money, money to spend within a space of 20 years, putting massive pressure <laughs> on all our resources, but offering fantastic opportunities for those brands that can work out how to um, fulfil that demand sustainably. And I won't go through these, you know all the stats, but a lot of these stats are starting to filter out now to the general public, to um, fashion's uh, consumers, fashion's target market. And so consumers increasingly are worrying about some of this and wanting brands to do something, something about it so they can feel better about what they buy. So to sum up kind of where we are now, we've got increasing population and consumption and that's leading to increasing pollution and waste. And we've got lots of new technology, meaning we can make more stuff and make it more cheaply. But all of that is reducing things. It's reducing finite resources and renewable resources. It's reducing jobs, and there's more of that to come with uh, automation and robot robotics. And crucially, it's, it's reducing biodiversity and those living systems we depend on for our survival. So we've reached a tipping point. Demand is outstripping supply. All that pressure on Earth systems we can see around the world is leading to civil war and geopolitical conflict, resource wars, if you like. So it's time to make a change. 
And looking at what consumers are worried about, looking at some of their megatrends, this is a recent report from Euromonitor, um, and they've picked out eight megatrends that they think are, are um, influencing consumers all around the world, or that consumers are getting excited about. So if we look at some of those in a bit more um, depth, so I've picked out these from the, from the report, and you can see in bold some of the, uh, sorry, some of the connecting um, themes. So it's moving from what we own to who we are, um, there's less priority to having stuff. Health is a new wealth. Um, and we were, I was talking to a couple of people about virtue signalling, so that's maybe a trend. Um, An ethical living. Um, but unfortunately, um, although consumers are becoming more eco-conscious, they're not necessarily yet prepared to spend more money. So that means, as a brand, you've got to be able to do sustainability for the same price as your competitors are doing business as usual. But that offers an opportunity. And the circular economy is one way of achieving that. So how do we define future fit if we're thinking about fashion? And what's going to follow is some early thinking I'm doing. So it's very much um, in draft form at the moment. Um, but it feels as if um, it, it might be a, a, a route forward for analysing um, whether, whether stuff really is good. And a few speakers earlier on have talked about elements of this, so it's kind of how do we join the dots. So there's a, an open-sourced uh, benchmark called the Future Fit Business Benchmark that can apply to any industry and offers you a way to go through the whole of your business and um, check whether you're behaving in a sustainable way. And it looks at the, the entire uh, value chain. And they have these four conditions um, which are taken from something called the Natural Step, which was started a couple of decades ago uh, in Canada and is all about sustainable um, living. So I've taken that and I've um, added one to it, which is about creating and sharing value. Because, as we've mentioned earlier on, it's one thing to be sustainable, but you also need to earn a living wage. Um, and if you're going to expand the brand and, exp and you know, kind of convince other people to do things that way, you need to have some profits to reinvest. So it's not necessarily about growing, but you need to be profitable and you need to be sharing value with employees, with suppliers, with customers, with the earth, with the society around your factories, you know, with every stakeholder along the chain. So it should be about creating value, not destroying it. So I thought it might be interesting to look at some materials. And as I say, this is an early draft. So um, there's the key with those five conditions, and I've kind of done it, done it in a simple way. You know, is it, is it um, good, okay, or poor? And I've looked at the, um, the supply chain. So if we think about cotton, that's the cotton seed or the cotton bowl and how that's grown, so the farming. If we're looking at polyester, it's how that fibre's produced. And then we get the process of turning it into a textile and what happens there. Then what happens when it's in use and what happens at the end of use. So we know there are loads of issues with uh, virgin cotton. It's water consumption, it's massive pesticide use, um, subsistence farming. A lot of farmers are, are applying those pesticides without any um, safety protection. So there's, there's just horrendous issues. But it's not much better for polyester either, um, you know, with emissions and, um, and obviously we're using a finite resource. Um, the process isn't great, so child labour and, and uh, forced labour there. And a lot of the dyes and chemicals... Um, are um, you know, toxic and harmful either to the workers and or the communities around uh, the factory. And often emissions and pollutants are not cleaned up in any way. They're all just going into local rivers that people are using for farming, um, drinking water and, and washing. Um, and even in use, you know, here we've, we're starting to see some issues around microplastics being shed um, in, the, in the washing system and ending up in, you know, easily in the water sources. Um, which are then consumed by fish, um, have been found in uh, salt, um, so the salt that we're putting on our food, uh, and if it's found in fish, it can easily end up back in our bodies. And nobody really knows, you know, whilst we think that plastics are inert, um, if they're damaging fish, then what do they do once our digestive system and stomach acid gets hold of them? Nobody really knows. Um, so I think just because there's no research, as the economists were saying in their plastics article, um, this week, which I'm planning to write a reposto. There were lots of things about, you know, there's no research or little research on this yet. That is not an argument for saying it's okay. So I think more and more um, brands are starting to 
um, look at this and wonder how um, transparent they're able to be about their supply chains, about how things are made, what chemicals are used in the process and so on. So just quickly to look at um, two types of polyester. So we're starting to see a lot of recycled polyester um, and RPT and so on. So it might be better in terms of its resource use there, um, but it costs about 10% more than, than virgin resources because of the complexities of getting um, the right type of fabric back through the supply chain because we don't really have the infrastructure set up. So if we had that, recycled polyester would be better than polyester, but we've still got those other issues about um, the dyes that we might have to use because it's not suited to low-impact dyes. Um, and also those microplastics and probably lots of other issues. And then we're starting to hear about all sorts of eco-fabrics. Uh, and somebody mentioned silk earlier, and I started to look at that. I didn't find much on it, but what I found wasn't, wasn't brilliant, this kind of piece silk. Uh, and I'm going to look further into that. But if we take, if we take virgin cotton and bamboo that's touted as an eco-fabric um, uh, in lots of places, seen as being really good. And so bamboo is a fantastic uh, crop um, because it's perennial, so you don't have to replant it every year. It's fast growing, it needs no inputs, doesn't need very much water, it can grow in marginal areas. That's all brilliant. But then the process that's used to make the vast, vast majority of bamboo is the viscose process, which many of you might know is heavily reliant on really toxic chemicals, um, harming the workers, um, that work in those factories and the people who live around them. Um, there is one supplier um, using a kind of lyocell sustainable process for bamboo, but there's hardly anything being made um, from that supplier at the moment. So it's something that, that could be good, but at the moment it's fair to say most of it's really horrendous. So I'm thinking something like this um, that could maybe be crowdsourced uh, and get all of us to be asking questions about um, and you know, asking brands to provide the answers to, you know, are you are you having uh, fair trade labour in your supply chain, or is it forced labour, or don't you even know because you've outsourced it and you've not inspected those kind of questions, and then making our judgments on whether um, the brands chosen to answer that question and put and make themselves transparent, or whether they're staying silent and hoping that um, you know they can do some other random act of greenness that will uh, throw us off the scent. So. Consumers and investors are starting to get much more interested in what the fashion industry is doing to clean up its act, use less resources and make itself sustainable into the future. Um, and it's not just about the use of resources and it's not just about biodiversity. Nine million people are dying from disease um, caused by all that pollution emitted along the supply chain, with fa fashion now being recognised as the second worst industry in the world. So there's lots of pressure coming to bear. And this is where the circular economy can come in and help those brands um, do things better in a more cost-effective and competitive way. And so the World Economic Forum, the European Union, China and lots of big consultancies are now starting to invest and help accelerate the circular economy, seeing lots of opportunities um, for... Um, savings right along the supply chain, but also in jobs. The circular economy and repairing and recovering, as we've said earlier, is not the kind of thing that can e be easily automated, particularly repairing and remaking. It requires a lot of judgment and skill, and so those are um, human-intensive and knowledge-intensive industries, which is brilliant because if we've got automation putting textile workers out of work, and if we look at Bangladesh where 80% of their exports are textile based, so if that all gets um, turned into robot activities, what's going to happen to those people? So the more that we repair, remake um, and recover, the more jobs we can create, which is brilliant. And when I was doing the research for my book, um, which started probably in um, 2011, I suddenly um, realised quite early on I had too many examples to hold in, hold in my head, so I started a database. And I now have over 500 examples of organisations around the world doing circular things, um, either with their business, their product or their materials. And what I found most exciting is that the majority of these are startups and small businesses. So to me that proves you don't need a big research and development budget, 
and the circular economy can create a viable business. And the easiest way to think about the circular economy is to contrast it with the way that we make things now. Typically, we use a throughput process, or what's sometimes called a linear process. We take some materials, we make something out of them, we use it, and then we throw it away. And along the supply chain, we're wasting things too. Wasting resources with um, offcuts, damages, and so on. And we're emitting pollution into the atmosphere and the air, into the soil and water. And also, all those embedded resources, the water that's used to grow the crop, the energy used along, all along the supply chain, um, the design input, the knowledge, human intellect, and of course all that human labour. Every time we throw something away, we're wasting all of that input too. So, let's think about an easy example to exemplify the social economy. Um, and uh, we, could, we could kind of say that in fashion terms, orange might be the new black. So if I was setting up a business to make fresh orange juice, I'd start with those raw materials and I'd, I'd end up with lots of waste. So the peel, all that white stuff, the pulp and the pips, um, none of that's going to go into my orange juice, so what can I do with them? And green chemistry and biorefining is finding lots of valuable byproducts from that simple product, the orange. So pectin, pulp and zest can all go back into food manufacture. Orange essential oils from the peel are valuable for both cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. And in fashion, um, there's now a company, at least one company, making fabric quite like silk from waste citrus peel. And it's being used at both ends of the fashion spectrum, the brand spectrum. So Ferragamo um, are making a top end material from it, and I think it's H&M are using it in um, more budget materials. So suddenly, I can make my business more resilient by using all those byproducts and selling them into different industries. And this is what um, a circular economy supply chain might look like. So the materials that we take, we want to be either recycled or genuinely renewable. So they're renewable within the lifetime of the product. If I'm cutting down trees to make cellulose and that tree takes 25 years to regrow, it's no good if I use all of that stock up in a week. That's not a sustainable uh, way of doing things. Um, and the materials should be safe for humans right along the supply chain, both the workers and the users, and they should be safe for living systems, otherwise we're just destroying stuff. We're making products that are designed to be more durable and designed for disassembly, as somebody mentioned earlier. So we're designing to make all of that easier. If they're more durable, we can either keep them for longer or we can make them shareable so they can be used more intensively. At the end of use, we want to get the product, the component and the materials back to be repaired, resold, maybe even remanufactured. And waste along the supply chain should all come back to be made into new products. And of course we've got those byproducts feeding in and out of the manufacture system. So this is the framework that I developed as a structure for the book showing all the points in the system where you can intervene to make things more circular. And we can think of it as a journey. It's not about necessarily trying to close the loop all at once. You can start anywhere in this system and just change one thing, make one material more circular, um, make the process more circular, and then start from there. So let's look, look at some examples from along that central flow, what I've called the design and supply chain. So if we think about those materials, the circular input, as I said, they need to be either recycled or renewable, safe for humans and living systems. And if they're recycled or renewable, then we've got security of supply over the long term. We're not worried about competing for finite resources. So in terms of fabrics, we might be looking at things that grow well in marginal places like hemp. And this example is from Chimera in West Yorkshire that make uh, contract fabrics and they've made fabrics from nettles and all sorts of stuff. Um, and abundant natural resources like seaweed and algae are being used for new materials and, and here as dyes. Um, and we've got um, fibres being made from brown alg algae. So this is a really abundant material and in fact um, over um, population of algae gives us problems so it would be a good way of, of getting rid of a problem. And somebody earlier mentioned mycelium. So that's the kind of underground part of a, of a mushroom. 
and it, um, we introduce the fungus to waste products like waste straw, and then we can grow things out of them. And an example is this uh, mushroom leather. Moving on to recycled and byproducts. So what else can we get from existing industries? So um, fish leather being used to replace reptile le leather, and Pinatex, um, and uh, that's a, a more sustainable way. It's kind of an industrialised way of making um, a fabric like linen or that can be used as a leather substitute from a traditional Philippine process where people were using pineapple leaves, so a waste from pineapple growing, and using the fibres from that to make really high quality material that was being used for wedding dresses and other things that you would put your hours and hours of labour into. So it was a great product, but it wasn't really, a, you couldn't be scaled up and, and sold. So Pinatex has found a way of um, making that sustainably and engaging the farmers, so they now have a byproduct. Um, but those of you who were at the um, RSA uh, Sustainable Fashion event in, in London were probably then a bit shocked when Pinatex, uh, they were there presenting, and they passed around some of their samples, um, which had kind of a glitter finish on them. And somebody uh, asked the question about where that, you know, how that glitter was applied and what was that made of. And we then realised that whilst the um, material itself might be sustainable, what they were then coating it with was anything but. So it seems a shame to have something that you could tell a really good story about and then make a mess of it later on. And if, we, you know, if I was doing that um, supply chain scoring, it would be red all over the process. So, and we've got lots of, lots of brands starting to include plastic waste in things that we didn't even know uh, could have plastic in them. So Levi's, recycling bottles, Recovertex, recycle um, uh, textiles from all over the world into really high quality yarn. And that can be a closed loop. So at the end of its next use cycle, it can come back again and be made into a new yarn. And you can also combine um, the recycling with a social enterprise. So Thread in, in Haiti um, you know, is helping people create some value from, from waste, whether that's from ocean plastics or um, other discards. And then you've probably heard of Elvis and Cressa. So their first product, um, they, they were looking at a way to um, recycle or reuse London fire hose. Um, because once there's a, uh, you know, the material's de degraded or got a hole in, obviously it's no good for putting out fires. But it's a really complex bonded material, so it wasn't easy to recycle. And they come up with this idea of recycling it into long-lasting products like belts, wallets and bags. And, and the bags are lined with parachute silk uh, rejects, which might have a tiny hole in them, so they're not going to hold the air for you to... Um, do a safe landing, but they're perfectly fit for purpose as a lining material. And Elvis and Cressa recently announced um, a partnership with the Burberry Foundation, and hopefully you can see on this. So what they're doing is using the offcuts from Burberry's um, leather um, products, and they've come up with a modular design that they can interlock together to make any size and shape um, of product, so whether it's rugs or bags or whatever. So suddenly they're able to take um, unpromising shapes and sizes and economically make a new product out of them. So I think that, that kind of concept of modular, modular design is really interesting. Um, and then um, big brands are getting involved in um, helping recycle those ocean plastics that we've heard a lot. So our Adidas pa um, partnering with Parley for the Oceans. And... Um, the Cradle's Cradle Institute, started by McDonough and, and Browngart, uh, probably more than 20 years ago. They've introduced um, a fashion-positive collection with cradle-to-cradle -cradle accessories, so you can go and look in that toolbox and find things to, to go with your sustainable fabric, um, like hemp or um, nettles or whatever. So looking at product design, here it's about using fewer materials to simplify um, the material spec and make it easier to recycle and of course using less of each of them. Um, we want to design it so it can be used more and used again afterwards after its first use cycle and we want to take a principle that says all waste should be food, either food for nature or food for another process, your own or to sell to somebody else. Uh, and uh, Rona in Switzerland were one of the first to develop a cradle's cradle fabric um, which by 2002 was making them eight million in, in revenues, and it took them a long time to do that. It was, a, you know, it was a lengthy project, um, but it's paying dividends now 
Um, and they're using um, the offcuts um, to make, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word, but kind of uh, covering fabric for ag agriculture, weed control, weed suppressants and so on. So even the waste is, is going into uh, good use instead of uh, a plastic. And a recent one uh, is Renew Cell, um, and here are some of the, um, the FAQ from their um, website, um, and they're just starting to scale up now. And this is their explanation of how their um, system um, meets the circular economy criteria. So um, other problematic fabrics are waterproofs, which are often multi-layered, Sympatex is a competitor to Gore-Tex um, and developed a concept jacket to show to the world uh, last year. So they, do, they make the fabric, not the jackets normally, but they did this concept jacket to prove it could be done. And one of the interesting things was that they included a return label inside the jacket. So when you finish with it, you could return it free of charge. So that way the company gets back all those valuable materials that they can reuse. They're not having to try and find it in some... Um, mixed up M&S swapping or you know Oxfam return system, um, and a fantastic innovation at Leeds University, working with Marks and Spencers, is Wear to Thread, which dissolves when subjected to low-level microwaves. So thinking back to that um, man's suit jacket that we saw before, with all those different materials, you can just subject it to those microwaves and it separates into its component parts, so each can then go into its appropriate recycling stream. And it costs about the same as regular thread. And again, thinking of that theme of using fewer materials, um, Bionit developed this, this uh, knitted shoe using just one material, so the whole thing can go into one simple recycling process. Um, and somebody mentioned this to me, um, I think it might have been Zoe if she's, if she's still here. So uh, Key Ecobi, um, which uh, was crowdfunding last year and they're hoping to be able to start their sales, um, I think it was the middle of March. Um, and uh, what they've developed is a self-assembly shoe. Um, there's a really good video. Um, uh, their site doesn't work, but if you go to the crowdfunder, you know, Key and Key Ecobi and you'll find it on crowdfunder and you can see the video there. So you can see the component parts. It's highly customizable, which really appeals to people wanting to personalize. So you can choose the, um, the different patterns and create something that looks like this or like that. Um, you know, and kind of, um, and it's the, the inner is separated from the outer um, and then um, can peel off. Um, so you can just take, take it off. If something wears out, you take that bit off and swap it for a new one. And it's washable. Um, so, you know, they're designing it to be long-lasting, to look good, uh, and you've had a big part to play in both choosing the design and making it. Um, not that you've had to sew anything, it all it kind of comes as a kit and you just put it together. So, um, you know, even a, um, a fashion dummy like me uh, should be able to manage that. And looking at the process, so we shouldn't forget about this, where we're using all those chemicals, dyes, um, and various additives, and that's the bit that tends to be ignored. We look at the fabric, we look at the way it's made, we look at what happens to it at the end of life, but we tend to forget about the process. So again, it's about using fewer um, different uh, chemicals and making sure that we take that waste is food approach. So we either recover those to use again ourselves, or we um, sell them to maybe a specialist green chemistry com com company to separate back into... Um, different chemicals that can be sold. Um, and of course water is a massive input uh, in many of the fashion uh, textiles, particularly cotton. So Levi's are working hard um, to look at how they can save water. Um, digital technology is playing a big part here. So digital dyeing allows much more precise application of those dyes instead of us using a bath and then um, sending the whole bath out um, to the lo local water system afterwards. Um, and uh, digital knitting, so that allows us not only to make a complex uh, and bespoke garment, we can make it on demand, so there's no stock, there's no obsolescence, we're only making what's needed. And back to those um, natural dyes using abundant materials, we don't want to be growing stuff specifically to make uh, a dye. 
taking that waste is food approach, here are all the byproducts that you can actually get from cotton right now. So could those big brands like H&M, Zara, M&S and so on, could they be helping those artisan smallholder farmers um, in getting all of these byproducts from cotton and helping them be more resilient instead of just having a monocrop and being reliant on that? And again, taking that waste is food approach, so Looped Works in America partners with a whole range of different companies to use their offcuts and making them into desirable products. So here we've got bags and so on made from um, the waste from motorcycle leather, so as they're cut out the various shapes and they've worked out a way to upcycle those into bags and then that laptop carrier is made from the waste from wetsuits. So lots of ways there and again that's partnerships and looking to see how the two companies can work together in a symbiotic way. And at the end of the process, we need to get those materials, components and products back um, so that we can recover those valuable resources and all those other inputs that we've invested in the, in the product. And um, Patagonia um, are probably the best known example of this. So they encourage you to resell anything that you've, you know, is either worn or you're fed up with. Um, and for years, they've been doing a free repair service. So uh, when the zip went on my more than 10-year-old fleece gilet, I was able to send it back to Patagonia free of charge, and it came back with a new zip in. But for some of the Patagonia products, like the climbing uh, sacks and so on, people might want to repair it themselves out in the field, not wait for Patagonia to do it. So Patagonia partnered with a global platform of uh, kind of um, techie people called iFixit, and their, their aim is to open source all the instructions for how to fix things like phones, cars, um, and anything else you care to mention. So Patagonia invited iFixit in to script all the repairs for co common Patagonia products. And you can go on there, find out how to do it, and then order the parts from Patagonia so you can do it yourself. And Patagonia was slightly worried that by advertising how repairable their stuff is, it might put consumers off. Did it make people think, this is more likely to break? But I fix it did some surveys and found it had the opposite effect. It kind of invokes a trust in the brand that they will stand behind that product and if it does go wrong, they'll put it right for you. So it actually increased brand loyalty for Patagonia, um, not the opposite. So again, that's a good um, lesson learned for the whole of the industry. And a more local one. So this is taking, um, doing something with uh, waste, waste materials. Um, and creating a social benefit as well. So Ruby Moon is using um, um, end-of-life uh, recovered plastics to make gym and, sh and swimwear, um, and it's investing the profits with micro-loans with women in developing countries, helping them set up businesses. And it's, it's doing that legally, it's not just a goodwill gesture, it sets itself up as a business for good, and that's its purpose, is to make profits so that it can help other businesses get going. So there's all sorts of other ways that you can um, create and share value with a wider group of stakeholders. And this quote is from the printing industry, but I suspect it applies to fashion as well. So for the print industry, um, it's not the paper recycling the that's the problem, it's all the ink and chemicals and coating for packaging um, that creates the, the issues, and I suspect that's the same for fashion. So we know all about M&S swapping and their donations to Oxfam, and we're probably all aware of um, ICO, um, partnering with a range of brands across Europe, but perhaps with limited success so far because it's all mixed materials and it's very labour-intensive. So we're looking for more automated ways to do this. Um, and this, was, um, uh, this press release is from um, only about a month ago, and the fibre sort's just going live. So an automated way to um, separate those mixed materials into different streams and take a lot of the labour intensity out of it. Um, and here's some of the, uh, the background. So this is EU funded, and I think if we can get the industry to work together and put the infrastructure in place to make recycling more cost effective um, and more efficient, then we can start to, to do something with those recovered materials. At the moment, they're all being downcycled into things like wadding for car seats and so on. Um, you know, unless uh, somebody on the front row gets hold of them first and turns them into a beautiful product. Mm -hmm. So, uh, business models. Um, I won't spend much time on this because we covered it earlier, but mud jeans is, is uh, an often used example. 
um, leasing the jeans to the customers. Um, so at the end of that lease, you can either swap it for a new pair, um, keep them yourself if you decided that you like them, or, or just send them back and stop leasing. And all the jeans that go back are either recycled or if they're still in good condition, are sold as vintage pairs. Um, and we all know about those, um, you know, at the back of the wardrobe things that we keep looking at and thinking, mm, must do something about that. Massive value there. Some of those um, consumers are starting to um, resell on things like eBay and FreeCycle. But the problem with perhaps selling a high-end brand on there, or more specifically, wanting to buy a high-end brand on there, is can you trust that it's genuine, or is it, you know, a kind of a, a look-alike? So that's given the opportunity for um, specialist uh, websites to get involved and guarantee the provenance, um, you know, by being very careful about um, who gives, who sells, and what, who puts what into the marketplace. And also offering to curate things for you so that you don't have to scroll through loads and loads of stuff that you're not interested in. Um, and that's been very successful. So it's kind of proving that there's a market for reselling uh, good, good quality stuff. And now renting as well, um, particularly for um, occasion wear. Uh, and somebody mentioned subscription um, models earlier. Um, there's um, a company called uh, Easy Kicks in America um, with a chap who used to work for Nike and he set up a, a subscription service for kids, sneakers they call them, but um, you know, trainers and uh, gym shoes as we'd see it. So as the children grow out or wreck the trainers, um, the subscription model gives you a new pair and the old ones go back to Nike who then get to see um, you know, how it's wearing, what's wearing out first, um, how it's being worn, if it's in good condition they might be able to resell it um, to maybe a developing market and so on as a, as a kind of, you know, nearly new pair. But they're starting to get much more engaged with the consumer and create this relationship with the consumer instead of just a transaction. So, conscious of time, am I already over or...? No, not no? Quite. Okay. So, what conclusions can we draw? Let's go back to that future fit um, example and think about fast fashion. So, um, assuming we could do all the right sorry, do all the right things along the supply chain by choosing the right materials that don't need lots of fertilisers, water use, grow on marginal land or, or use a waste product. Um, we're using abundant natural materials in a closed loop uh, and we're making them easy to care for. Then that's all great, but what happens at the end of the process? So it needs to be either biodegradable and safe and we need to be careful with biodegradable because... Um, it's being applied to plastics when really what we mean is oxidegradable. So yes, it decomposes, but not into food for nature. It decomposes composes into plastic fragments, which then become microplastics that end up in um, water sources. So we need to be careful with that. So if it's biodegradable, that means it should be food for nature. Or it's recyclable, and we've got the infrastructure in place to bring it back. So that way... Um, if, you know, if we've got a light footprint on the earth and those materials are genuinely renewable within the life cycle and we're not using land um, to grow crops for fashion that could be used for growing food, you know, we're not competing with things, then we could have a sustainable fast fashion model. But what about slow fashion where it's durable, repairable and engaging? So it looks similar, but because it's longer lasting, um, it can have more use cycles, so it can be resold and repaired multiple times before eventually going to be recycled. So this is the kind of thing that I think um, the big brands should be aiming at. So they could put this on their websites and know that that kind of thing was, was true and they could stand behind each of those boxes and tell you um, what goes into it, how it's made, who's making it, that they're given um, a fair wage that the societies around those factories um, are not being impacted and the, and the um, biodiversity is not being impacted by, the, by their product. So it's not about doing less bad, it's about doing more good. Um, and those are some of the guidelines um, that we might want them to, uh, to follow. So we need to rethink. Um, we need to go beyond sustainability and we need to be thinking about um, how we have enough for all of us, all those new consumers, forever. Not just enough for us in, in the developing world, 
but you know properly enough for all of us and doing it using um, you know fair wages for everybody and creating value for everybody along the supply chain. And I always like to finish with this quote from Ray Anderson, who sadly died a couple of years ago, who was the founder of Interface that we're going to hear from in a minute. Um, and his view was that we should aim to take nothing, waste nothing, do no harm, and crucially, do well by doing good, at the expense not of the planet, but of your less alert competitors. Thank you.